Pastor on two. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. It's Tonight on A Turning Point, turning words into action, we explore Heather McGee's book, The Sum of Us, what racism costs everyone and how we can prosper together. The majority of white Americans tend to see the world and have been taught to see the world in a way that says that progress for people of color might have to come at their expense. Aspiring to a brighter American future, she set out on a journey throughout the country, including stops in our own backyard, looking to history here in Warren, Ohio, to discuss the book's metaphor of draining public pools rather than integrating them, to foreclosure and redlining that crippled homeowners of color in Cleveland's Mount Pleasant neighborhood, and the push for intentional integration to diversify our classrooms, which some Ohio parents are embracing. Plus, addressing voter suppression and environmental policies, racial bias, and fear that cost all of us. Those stories and more tonight on this special edition of Front Row, A Turning Point. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us. This is Front Row, A Turning Point, and tonight's special focuses on Heather McGee's award-winning book, The Sum of Us. I'm Jim Donovan, alongside Sarah Shookman. Yeah, The Sum of Us explores the idea that little will change until all of us realize what racism costs us, white people too. But how do we, as Americans, get to a place of social solidarity? Well, I had the chance to sit down with McGee to discuss her book and the research that took her across the country, including stops here in Ohio, to find solutions to what she calls the zero-sum theory. The sum of us is the idea that we are stronger together. Author Heather McGee shows us the math. Together is better. But in her New York Times bestselling book, The Sum of Us, she explains in America, we aren't buying into the equation. This zero sum idea, the idea that there's a fixed pie of well-being, if we get a bigger slice, they must get a smaller slice, is a really dominant worldview in America. And it's actually racialized. It's a sense that there's a racial competition. The zero-sum paradigm, McGee argues, is at its heart driven by racism. That is, the idea that progress for some of us must come at the expense of others. We end up rooting against our own teammates. You think of the economy as a game. You want all your best players on the field scoring points for your team. You don't want any of them sidelined. But the zero-sum lie tells you that we're not all on the same team. McGee saw it in her work heading the D.C. think tank Demos and wanted to learn why. So in 2018, she hit the road, traveling the country to explain through the stories of everyday Americans, including here in Northeast Ohio. In the book, she recounts an earlier experience in Cleveland's Mount Pleasant neighborhood that foreshadowed the foreclosure crisis. I am emotional about it as I was on that fateful day in 2007 when I walked the neighborhood in Salt all of the homes that were in foreclosure that didn't have to be, that shouldn't have been. And here's why, for me, it's very clear that without racism, we would not have had the financial crash of 2008 and lost trillions of dollars in wealth and 8 million jobs. It's because black families, like those in Mount Pleasant, were the canaries in the coal mine early on. McGee's work also explores issues of politics, unions, education, and others that ripple across cross-sections of Americans and why we're all struggling together. To try to answer a simple question, but that was a vexing one, which was, 
Why does it seem like we can't have nice things? By nice things, McGee says she's not talking about luxury goods. She means universal health care, a living wage, well-funded public schools. These are the types of things that we as Americans should have. And that used to be a part of a sense of an American dream that it feels like the lights are being turned out on. To fix it, McGee's book outlines the moments she sees as solidarity dividends. It's this idea that there can be gains that we can unlock, but only when we come together across lines of race. It's things where there are solutions to common problems, and if we come together, the power of the many can take over the few who are standing in our way. McGee's book highlights how racism drained America's pools, both figuratively through diminished public resources and quite literally in the segregation of the nation's municipal pools. Lena Lai takes a look at efforts to overcome the generational impact of Ohio's past. Dalton Wahomey loves to swim. It's good to be safe and learn how to swim, but it's also a really fun sport to do. That's why we need to exercise with our arms. And providing affordable swim lessons for all kids is a passion for Dalton's dad from the Lakewood YMCA. The mindset is how much is it going to cost me or can I afford it? I think that becomes a barrier right there. Because in these waters, you'll find the intersection of race and class. According to USA Swimming, 64% of African-American children can't swim, compared to 45% of Hispanic children and 40% of white children. The reason? Scholars point to the social history of America's public pools. We, as a nation, seem to have this inability to factually and correctly address our past. Kent State professor Molly Merriman's documentary, Invisible Struggles, explores the personal stories of segregation in Warren, Ohio. Back in that day, uh, they didn't let us uh, muddy the water. In 1934, the gleaming Packard Pool opened in Warren's Packard Park, a whites-only public pool. In 1945, instead of desegregating the pool, the city leased it to a private swim club. The Veterans Swim Club was supposed to be open to all veterans. However, all black veterans were denied membership. Because African-American kids weren't able to swim in the, the public pools, there there was a river and and it, it, it was... Uh, more than one kid who drowned. Well, instead of having a, a safe pool with training and lifeguards and all of that, their option was one that was, in fact, deadly. The local NAACP sued the city of Warren, and NAACP lawyer Thurgood Marshall successfully argued the case to desegregate Packard Pool. Thurgood Marshall, the first of his race so honored. Marshall would later become the first African-American U.S. Supreme Court justice. Still, pools were unwelcome waters. In Cincinnati, whites threw nails and glass into pools and poured acid and bleach in Florida. Cities closed their pools instead of integrating, and private pools took their place. In 1969, a bold television moment that sent a message when Mr. Rogers shared a wading pool with Officer Clemens. That feel great. Segregation began to be dismantled, but prejudice remained. And Manuel is going to do it! Oh! But in 2016, Simone Manuel won Olympic gold and broke historical barriers. You are the first African-American woman to medal in an individual event in swimming. Winning my gold medal really represents my mission and my goal of being an inspiration to others. While here at home, the YMCA of Greater Cleveland is also working to close the minority gap with a $10,000 grant to provide free or low-cost lessons. There is a huge generational gap that was lost, and it's going to take time to bring that back. Making strides, one stroke at a time. Lena Lai, 3 News. Now, many of the social and economic problems faced by blacks are rooted in policies put in place by the government generations ago. One of those bad policies is called redlining, and it still has a lasting impact today. Brandon Simmons explores the history of that policy and what can be done to change its course. 
According to a UC Berkeley study, Cleveland is the sixth most segregated major city in the country, with most people of color living in east side neighborhoods facing extreme disadvantages. It was in Mount Pleasant, it was Pierce St. Clair, it was Glenville, it was uh, the Kinsman neighborhood. Lee Harvard. Visit any one of those Cleveland neighborhoods and you'll see remnants of what used to be years of decay, blight. It's the result of a practice rooted in racism called redlining. Redlining was a systemic denial of services that began in the 1930s, primarily affecting people of color. They were denied access to credit and insurance, and businesses refused to invest in those neighborhoods that were shaded on maps. The neighborhoods were outlined in red, meaning that they were the highest risk. That's where we get the term redlining from, or redlined. Um, and those neighborhoods were much more often um, predominantly African-American. Look at the roadblocks put in place that prevented people of color from owning a home and gaining the wealth that they otherwise should have been able to gain just as their white counterparts did. Jim Rokakis is the former treasurer of Cuyahoga County. Even though redlining was outlawed more than 50 years ago, he watched as neighborhoods affected by redlining were again victimized during the Great Recession through subprime lending. If you look and see where redlining occurred in Cleveland and you look and see who was most damaged by the foreclosure crisis, they are the same neighborhoods. And if you look to see where the recovery has been today, the weakest recovery is in those very same neighborhoods that were redlined. Redlining not only robbed blacks of home ownership, its lasting impact is felt in other areas. Dangerous lead levels in homes, lack of reliable internet access, even health care disparities. Things like asthma, um, maternal death after birth, um, certain types of cancers are actually much higher uh, in historically redlined neighborhoods. Gwen Donnelly, a pre-doctoral candidate at Case Western Reserve University, has studied the issues. This is one of the most clearly intentional um, cases of discriminatory housing policy um, that we can see ever. They saved in their notes, this neighborhood is mostly black, therefore we are redlining it. And fixing the problems it created won't be easy, although progress is being made. Neighborhood development corporations are investing in affordable housing options as land banks work to tear down vacant properties. If you live on a street where there are four or five vacant houses and there's no chance of anybody coming back, the best solution, as brutal as it seems, is to remove that property and to start over. It's no easy task, but a necessary one, since experts say blight often spreads as entering suburbs are starting to see, which is why raising awareness and eliminating discriminatory practices are so important. You can't keep saying it's not my problem, it's their problem. And so education is an important first step, I would say, for anybody who's working um, with public policy, our local council people, our mayor, it's important for everybody to be aware of this. In Cleveland, I'm Brandon Simmons, 3 News. Coming up, a look at the good school, bad school debate, how it ties into a history of racism and what some parents are doing to change the narrative.
Welcome back to Front Row, A Turning Point. We continue to explore author Heather McGee's journey through the lens of her book, The Sum of Us. As Danielle Wiggins explains, there's a modern day push to desegregate our schools, which is starting to spread across Ohio. <laughs> for self-reflection and change can come from any source, including this school talent show from the mid to late 1980s. This was actually the moment where I was like, oh, hang on a second. She's fit. She's fit. She looks like a rat. The boy on the left in the black and blue shirt is Andrew Lefkowitz at eight or nine years old. Well, I was one of a small handful of white kids, the handful of white kids at the school. For Andrew, watching himself in this old video reminded him of how going to a Denver public school with classmates of different races wasn't always an easy experience, but it was one he was thankful for because it prepared him for the real world. It gave me a real uh, different sense of the world, I think. I, I recognized as I entered spaces in the future, uh, uh, comfort that I had being around people who were different from me. He also thought of his daughters. That was a moment where I was like, ooh, like I need my kids to be in an environment like that. Andrew connected with Integrated Schools. It's a national grassroots movement started by the late Courtney McKitten, where and white and our privileged parents voluntarily send their kids to schools with a student body of mostly black and brown children. These parents say they're prioritizing integration as a way to advance equity in education for the well-being of all children and American democracy. We live in a multiracial democracy. We want everyone to be able to work together to solve common problems that we all have. Um, and I think there's a lot better chance of that happening if all of our kids go to school together. Emily Brown is the co-leader of the newly formed Integrated Schools chapter in Columbus. She sends her children to their neighborhood public school. And although Emily says her family lives in a mostly white community, the school has a majority of black and brown students. Many people in our neighborhood send their kids to private schools. What's the problem? Well, in her book, The Sum of Us, Heather McGee writes, the boom in private schools was a reaction to school integration in the 1950s and 60s after the landmark Supreme Court case, Brown versus Board of Education, which ruled racial segregation in public schools unconstitutional. McGee cites research showing white students now make up 69% of K-12 private school enrollment, and the majority of public school students in the U.S are now children of color. Nobody I know goes to those schools. I want my child to have academic peers. It's just not a good fit for us. I want Both McGee and parents in the integrated like schools movement argue an obstacle to modern day integration is the narrative about good and bad schools. When you think like, you know, close your eyes and imagine a good school, what you imagine is a largely white student body, lots of money, lots of resources. Um, that, is, that is the vision of good school that, that kind of culture perpetuates. In a webinar from 2020, Andrew, who is now on the Integrated Schools leadership team and hosts their podcast, explains how after Brown v. Board, white parents began to use race-neutral language in order to maintain white supremacy and segregation in schools. White parents stopped saying, at least out loud, I don't want my kid to go to school with black kids. They started saying things like, I want my kid to learn a curriculum that's in line with my values. Andrew admits he once believed that racial neutral narrative. You know, I had bought into this idea of risk, this idea that kind of I was going to set my kid up for failure, that I was going to harm them in some way. And so and so we thought, well, we better do what everybody says we should do, which is go to the good school. But this talent show and what he was learning about integration allowed Andrew to pull his daughter out of the so-called good school and send her to the one he attended as a child. When you look on any website that tries to rate schools, everything would say we moved from a great school to a terrible school. And that was not at all the experience we had. I mean, my kids are, are thriving, they are learning, they are growing. And Andrew's daughter is performing on the exact same stage where he stood 30 years ago. The hope is that the sight of children from different races growing and learning in school together today will be the catalyst for producing positive change tomorrow. Thanks, Danielle. Up next, a closer look at the American democratic process, the battle for voters' rights in Ohio that has far-reaching implications for all.
Welcome back. In the Some of Us, Heather McGee examined so-called voting reforms that have resulted in the disenfranchisement of black voters and even white, and even white voters. Mark Namick examines McGee's connection to voter advocacy here in Ohio and recent efforts to fight voter suppression. The nonprofit Heather McGee once had it led the fight against Ohio's efforts to invalidate the registration of voters who did not cast ballots regularly. The purge done under Ohio's then Secretary of State John Husted and those before him affected tens of thousands of voters, many in Ohio's urban counties. Houston, now the state's lieutenant governor, claimed removing dead people and inactive voters improved the integrity and efficiency of elections. McGee's nonprofit and other groups sued, arguing low-income voters and voters of color were most affected. But central to the case was Larry Harmon, a white Navy veteran from Portage County whose registration was canceled because he had not voted in six years. When I went to vote, I went into the hall and I looked up my name and I looked and I looked but I didn't see my name. At issue was the state's method of notifying inactive voters of the purge. It required them to respond to a postcard, start voting again, or be dropped. I, I didn't think I was required to vote at every election. The case made it to the U.S. Supreme Court, which ruled Ohio's purge process, when applied uniformly, did not violate the Voting Rights Act. Activists said the case nonetheless drew much needed attention. The supplemental process, also known as the voter purge, uh, is still a very real and present danger. In the last big election, Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose released the names on the purge list, allowing voter groups to scrutinize it. There in 2019, there was over 400,000 people on the voter rolls um, that were to be purged, and it was folks who were um, active voters. Voter groups pointed out mistakes for elections officials, which kept thousands of active voters rightfully on the rolls. That should have been a red flag to um, to legislators and to public officials that like this process is wrong. Voter groups say that collaboration made a big difference, but their work is under attack. This past summer, Ohio's Republican-led state house passed a provision in the budget bill that prohibits elections officials from, quote, collaborating with outside groups. We see even the, the impact that voter rights groups and advocates did with the purge, that is an attack on our on our election system. And it criminalizes, um, it criminalizes the act of collaboration for election officials, which is very, very scary. Provisions viewed as restricting voting advocacy and easier ballot access have been fueled by unfounded claims pushed by former President Trump and others that the 2020 election was rigged. 2020 presidential election was by far the most corrupt election in the history of our country. There's never been anything like this. McGee says the country has a long history of voter suppression activities meant to preserve power but at a cost to all. I figured out through my journey was that the economic costs of a racially unequal system, of racism in our politics and our policymaking are so hidden and yet so huge that ultimately it has a cost for us all, white people too. When we return, a look at how environmental racism hurts us all. A conversation with local leaders working to involve all voices in racial justice and climate action.
Now we turn to concerns surrounding environmental racism and justice. Earlier this week, 3 News contributor Chris Webb moderated a panel discussion on how to be solution oriented when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion related to climate and environmental issues. Here's part of that conversation. Every single human being is impacted by the environment. I mean, that's just fact. And so, so much of what you see when it comes to environmental justice, I mean, I like the term environmental racism because I think it's much more honest. Racism has many cousins. Um, it shows up in many sectors um, and environmental uh, sector is just one. I recently spoke with the director of the Ohio Climate Justice Fund, Leah Dunhall, and the program director for climate and environment justice with the George Gunn Foundation, John Mitterholzer, about environmental justice and the changes that need to happen in the movement. We have been woefully underfunding BIPOC leaders across the country in the environmental movement. Right now, the work that the Ohio Climate Justice Fund is doing while it's focused on climate is also racial liberation work. What our grants do is supply dollars to organizations to host community listening conversations in their neighborhoods about climate and clean energy. And these conversations and grant opportunities reopen in February. But one thing is clear, the time is now for both action and change. When you talk about a clean energy sector, no longer do you have to sacrifice your health to have upward mobility for your family. That's environmental justice. You can find the complete conversation on our website, WKYC.com, under the section, A Turning Point. Well, the award-winning book, The Some of Us, got a lot of people talking, and that's why 3 News is partnering with Cuyahoga County Public Library to host a virtual community conversation with the author, Heather McGee, this spring. The updated paperback version is out next month. If you'd like to read the book, you can also visit your local library branch to check out a copy or visit the website on your screen right now to access the ebook or the audio version. That's our time for tonight. Thanks for being with us. 3 News will be back at 11. Have a great night.